hope you brought your Bibles, because that's what we study in the word in, here at this church. We study the Word of God. Turn to chapter 43 in Genesis as we are learning and going over the life of Joseph, the story of a life well spent. And we're in chapter 43, and the title of today's sermon is called True Repentance. True, what is true repentance? What does that look like? Um, as you are turning to Genesis 43 in your Bible, uh, as you know, I love Disney movies. And uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of this movie. It's kind of new. You may not have heard of it. Uh, it's the movie called Frozen. Uh, if, I don't know if you've heard of it. Uh, if you're trying to think, well, maybe I've heard of it. Well, if you can't think of it, just let it go. That's pretty good, right? See, that was a song in the movie, and people sung it so often, people got sick of it. But anyway, in the movie Frozen, there's a song called Fixer Upper, and it's performed by a, a group of trolls whom Kristoff describes as love experts. In the song, they're trying to convince Anna to marry Kristoff, and despite the fact that he's a bit of a fixer upper, there's a line in the song that says, quote, we, are saying, we aren't saying you can change him because people don't really change. That's not true, is it? Have you ever heard of the phrase, a leopard can't change his spots? We've heard that phrase before. People say people can't change, but that isn't true. People can change. We've, heard, we've all heard about people with addictions be set free from it, and they live meaningful lives. But the best and surest way for a person to change is through a salvation experience with Jesus Christ. And if the church has but one mission, that's its mission, is to share the life-changing mission, the life-changing experience of Jesus Christ. You remember the story of the blind man, right? Where Jesus went and they saw the blind man and Jesus healed the blind man and was able to see. And the blind man went into the town and everybody knew who this guy was. And they kept saying, well, who did this? And he said, Jesus. And so they started asking him questions about Jesus, right? Well, is he the Messiah? Is he who he says he is? Who is, how did he do this? What is this? And you know what? He, he just... He didn't know anything, but he did know this, that once, was, once he was blind, but what? Now he can see. And we who have been changed by the life-changing uh, Holy Spirit in our lives, we are, should be just like that. We are a testimony that God can change people's lives. It is only through the work of salvation, through the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a person that a person can have the power of God to change their life. That is why we say salvation is, and I'm going to put this on the board, what is salvation? A lot of people don't understand what salvation is. Well, let me give you a definition. I've said this lots of times, but I want to put it on the board for those who are taking notes. Salvation is the supernatural act of God by which the Holy Spirit does a work of regeneration. Now, that's a big word, isn't it? Regeneration. All that means is to make alive again. That's what it means. To regenerate. You once were dead, but now you're what? Alive. So it's the supernatural act of God. That's important. It's a supernatural act of God. We, don't, we can't save ourselves. We don't have the ability to save ourselves. So something has to happen first. Well, what has to happen? God has to do something in your life first. So that's why we say it's a supernatural act of God by which the Holy Spirit does a work of regeneration in the life of a person by which the Spirit transformed the dead soul and the dead spirit and makes it alive again. It's an outward demonstration. So an outward demonstration of an inward change is shown with an affection towards Christ and the things of Christ. That's important. That's really important. How do we know we're saved? 
How do we know that God actually did a work of salvation in our lives? How do we know? We know because then we have an outward demonstration of an inward change that is shown with an affections towards Christ and the things of Christ. What are the things of Christ? His people. Jesus loves people. Jesus loves lost people, and Jesus loves those whom he saves. Jesus loves people. Sometimes people aren't so easy to love, are they? Sometimes people are kind of mean and, and ungrateful, but it doesn't matter. One of the ways that you know that you've been saved is you have an affection towards Christ. God, I love you. Lord, I'm here to follow you all the days of my life. I know what you've done for me. You've changed my life inside out. And now I want to love those things that you love. Well, what are the things that God loves? Well, God, Jesus loves the Father, right? Jesus loves other people. Jesus loves the what? Church, right? Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wife as what? Christ loved the church. It's not by works that we are saved, but it's by His grace. And so, people can change. Now, we are studying the life of Joseph, and we're studying about his family. And as we've studied the life of Joseph these past weeks, if there was ever a family in need of change, it is the sons of Jacob. The oldest Reuben slept with his father's wife. Simon and Levi, the second and third sons, murdered all of the men in the nearby city of Shechem. Ten of them agreed to beat up and throw Joseph in a pit, and they had a very real discussion about killing their brother Joseph. These are bad guys. But the fourth son, the fourth son, Judah, he was the worst of them all. And it is he that I want to focus on in Genesis chapter 43. Before chapter 43, you can make a very strong case that Judah was the most horrible, self-absorbed person you have ever met. Now, in a moment, we're going to go over all the sins of Judah, and it's going to sound like I'm piling on. But I'm going to labor this point, and if you'll just stick with me, I'm going to labor this point because I want you to see what God can do to a person. Okay? All right. So let's get a quick reminder of what we know about Judah before chapter 43. In Genesis 37, 26, Judah is the one who talks his brother out of killing Joseph and selling him, in, selling him as a slave instead. You go, well, see, he's not so bad. He's not so Hey, wait a minute, Pastor Daniel. That's a good thing. He talked him out of killing him. Yeah. But selling them into slavery, that's not good. See, that's, that's how warped we are. How many of y'all thought, hey, wait a minute, he's not so bad. He kept them from killing them, but they still sold them into slavery. How many of y'all thought, come on now. Some of y'all thought, see, he's not so bad. That's still pretty bad. Uh, he was his brother. So he gets no credit for that. Genesis 37, 31 through 35, Judah was a part of the lie that broke his father's heart. They told him Joseph was dead and, jo and Jacob entered an, extend entered an extended time of mourning. How about that? It's not enough that you sold your brother, but you sat there and lied to your dad, and you saw the grief of your dad's heart, and you were so callous that you didn't even go, you know what? Okay, dad, I'm sorry. I see how much that hurt you. I'm going to confess. This is what we did. Nope. They lied, and they kept the lie up. Genesis 38, 1, Judah sought a wife, and he married an unbeliever. Now you say, well, now, why is that such a bad thing? Well, he married an unbeliever, and she was a Canaanite, and God specifically told them not to do that. Don't marry this group of people. Why? Because bad company corrupts good morals. And so, but what did Judah say? I don't care what you say, God. I know I've been raised to, to worship and serve you, but I'm going to do my thing my way, and I'm going to do it. And so I'm going to marry. In fact, God, I'm going to marry a group of people that you specifically told me not to marry. That's how hard of heart he was. So what happens? 
Genesis 38, 7 through 10. He raised his two sons, Ur and Onan, and they were so evil that God killed them both. Now, I don't know, we don't know what evil things they did, but think about all the evil people that you've seen in the world and you know in the world, and God has lived them, allowed them to live a, a life. But these people were so evil that God killed them personally. That's pretty bad, isn't it? And that's what Judah did. Judah, in Genesis 38, 12 through 16, Judah was a man controlled by fleshly lust. His wife died, and he sought for female companionship in the bed of a woman he thought was a harlot. Genesis 38, 12 through 23, Judah was guilty of committing incest with his sister-in-law, Tamar, and she, tr and she tricked him, but he's still responsible for his actions. Genesis 38, 24 through 30, Judah was, Judah was judgmental. Tamar, his daughter-in-law, became pregnant through their incestuous relationship, and Judah ordered her to be burned for her infidelity, even though it was him that did it. And when she, when she exposed him for the hypocrite that, she wa that he was, he realized how bad he had fallen. So, what do we know? He thought of a plan to sell Joseph into slavery. He married a non-believer, had two sons so evil that God killed him, solicited a prostitute. He was a failure as a son. He was a failure as a husband. He was a failure as a father. And he is a self-absorbed hypocrite. This is not a good guy. And you're saying, man, Pastor Daniel, you are killing this guy. No, I'm just showing you who he was. Because I'm about to show you who he is. And that can only happen through the transforming life of God. And I want you to know, I don't know where you are in your world today. I don't know where you are in your walk. Today. I don't know who you know. But there may be somebody who thinks that they're so sinful that they can't possibly be forgiven by God. There may be somebody in your life that they think, you know, I've done all these evil things. Man, I've done some evil things. And I know I've, I've, had, I've had conversation with people, and they say, Pastor Daniel, you don't know what I've done. I said, yep, I sure don't, and I don't need to know. But I want you to know this. We serve of God. Are you still with me, church? We serve of God. This is so great. We serve a God that has more grace than you have sin. There is, there is not a single person who has ever lived, who lives now, or who will live, who is so sinful that exceeds God's grace. And there's not anybody who's ever lived, who are living, or who's ever lived, before, who's going to live, who's so good that they don't need God's grace. All men everywhere, and when I say men, I mean people, all people everywhere are sinners. And all people everywhere desperately needs God's grace. Amen? Amen? And we who have experienced God's grace should be the most celebratory people on the face of the earth because we have been set free from the wrath of God by His grace. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the line of the tribe of Judah. How evil was was Judah is pretty doggone evil. Can I say that? I don't, know if it, I don't know if it's really proper for a pastor to say doggone, but I do say that. But he was a pretty bad dude, right? But listen to this. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Judah's name and the rest of his brothers will be on the foundation stone of New Jerusalem. Judah's name is honored because through his lineage came the Messiah, the author and the finisher of our faith. You see, where a lot of people see evilness, God sees his grace in the lives of people. And God works. God is, we serve a God who fixed broken things. This world is absolutely broken. People who follow the world's suggestions to do, to live all they want, to live as if there is no God, to, you know, eat, drink, and be merry for, for tomorrow you die. I met a guy who said, you know, I'm not afraid of dying. I'm willing to die right here, right now. I don't care. And I said, well, you must not believe in a God. 
Because you wouldn't say that if you really knew who God is and what he, what he thought of your sin. He said, I don't care. I want to die. Well, okay. But God is, the, is in the business of changing people's lives. How is that possible? How is it possible for someone so evil as Judah is now whom God chooses to bring his royal line through? Well, we love and serve a God who makes the impossible possible. We worship a God who is in the life-changing business. We follow the one who gives hope to the hopeless, make the spiritually dead alive, give spiritual sight to the blind, and we serve a God who holds the keys of hell and death. And we ourselves are walking, living, breathing testimony of a life-changing salvation that only Jesus Christ can bring. So, this is a story of how someone as disgusting as Judah has had his life change, and there's a word in the Bible for change, and that word is called repentance. Repentance. Now, we tend to think of the word repentance. We have a visual of a man with a with skinny guy with a white gown, with a big beard, holding a sign saying what? Repent or perish or something like that. And we tend to think that's doom and gloom. But that's a wrong way of thinking of repentance. Repentance is sweet. We should repent every day because every day we sin. So, real quick, before we go into Genesis 43, I want to explain to you what true repentance means. Repentance is no more a materialist work than its counterpart faith. Repentance is an inward response to what the Holy Spirit is doing through the conviction of sin. Through the conviction of sin, judgment, and righteousness. That should be on the board. In John 16, 8, and conversion, the regeneration of the purpose of a person's heart through life in Christ. John MacArthur said this, Genuine repentance pleads with the Lord to forgive and deliver the burden of sin and the fear of judgment and hell is an attitude that the, of, the, of the publican who, in fear of even looking toward heaven, smote his, breath, smote his breast and cried out, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus says, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. So repentance is very important in the life of a church. So what is repentance? Well, repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of heart that leads to a change of action. Did you get that? It's a change of mind that leads to a change of heart that leads to a change of action. In salvation, this change involves both a turning from sin and a turning to God. It's like this. Faith That's trusting God in what God said and what Jesus did. And repentance, a change of mind and heart about what God said and what Jesus said, are two sides of the same coin. Repentance turns from your sin to Christ and faith embraces Christ as the only hope of salvation and righteousness. Proverbs 28, 13 says, Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes will obtain mercy. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, For godly grief produces, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas the world grieves produces death. The reason why men, Christians, are still troubled, are still seeking, still making little forward progress in their Christian life is because they haven't yet come to the end of themselves and they're still trying to give orders and inferring with God's work with the, within us. That's A.W. Tozier. Now, how important is repentance? Are you still with me? Okay. What, what is it? This is important. Without repentance, you can't get saved. Without repentance, you can't please God. And repentance, let me tell you what repentance is not. Repentance is not saying, God, I'm sorry. That's not repentance. So, what is, so how important is repentance? Well, i got to speak fast. Because I told you all I wouldn't preach for an hour, so we got to get going. 
Are you ready? You got to do a better job of listening quite faster. All right, here we go. But this is so important. Repentance is what? Matthew 3, 12. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew eleven twenty. 20. Then Jesus, he, began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done, because they did not what? Repent. Mark 1, 15 and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Mark 6, 12. So they went out and proclaimed the people should what? Repent. So what were they preaching? To repent. To repent. Luke 13, 5 through, uh, 3 through 5. No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 of whom the Tower of Solomon fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all those who live in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. So what Jesus is talking about, he says, you need to what? Say it, church. Repent. But we don't preach repentance anymore. We don't. And I think we kind of watered down the gospel a little bit. Luke 15, 10, just so I tell you, there's joy before the angels of God over one sinner who, what? Repents. Luke 24, 7, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in His name to all nations beginning with Jerusalem. So that's Jesus talking about repentance. Real quick, in the book of Acts, what's the Acts? The book of Acts is the history of the church. It's the beginning of the church. And so their message to the people is very important, isn't it? Because they've been taught by Jesus directly, and now they're going to teach what they've been taught. So what did they teach? Acts 2.38. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the first thing he did was, he didn't go, Look, God will meet you in the... No, he didn't do it. He goes, repent. Repent. In a moment, we're going to talk about what it means. Acts 3.19. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. Acts 5.31. God exalted him at the right hand as a, as a Savior, a Lord and Savior. I know I messed that. I'm, that's wrong. To give repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sin. Acts 2, 8.22, repent therefore of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible, the intent of your heart that may be forgiven you. Acts 17.30, the time of ignorance God has overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. If the word of God is true, that one verse should be enough for everyone to understand that God calls all men Everywhere to do what? Repent. Repent. Acts 26, 20. But declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. So, is there any question now? The main thing that we should be teaching people is to do what? Is repent. So what on earth does that mean? Pastor Dan, you've already said that it doesn't mean say, God, I'm sorry. That does not know what, that's not what it means. The Greek word metanoia means this. It means to change your mind about who God is, about what sin is, and about judgment. What did the Bible say the Holy Spirit was going to do? Convict the world of sin, judgment, and righteousness, right? And so, when you were not a Christian, your view of sin was what? Didn't matter. It was no big thing. I don't care. We all sin. You know, God grades on a curve. Judgment. It's not really going to be a judgment. I mean, it's all good. We're good. I'm good. You're good. We're all good. And righteousness. Christ's righteousness doesn't mean anything to me. I don't care. My unrighteousness doesn't mean anything I don't care. The Bible says you need to repent of that thought. You need to repent 
of that thinking. You need to repent. You need to change your mind of that. So as a Christian, God the Holy Spirit does the work of changing our hearts, and so we do repent. So the world, the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, judgment, and righteousness. Now, as Christians, what do we think of sin? We think it's cosmic high treason against God, don't we? We see how truly sinful we really are. Because of our truly abject sinfulness, we now know that we need a what? Savior. That's what repentance means. So we change your mind about sin. Sin is a big deal. Sin does grieve God's heart. And we don't love sin. We hate sin. We see what sin does in this world, and we hate it. So we change our mind about sin. We change your mind about judgment. There is judgment that's coming. You say, Pastor Daniel, I don't believe it. It doesn't matter if you believe it. It's still coming. You know, uh, here's an illustration. There, may be, there was a guy, maybe there's this road, right? Think about this road. And this road, there's this guy that's standing up and going, don't go past the bridges out, right? And you look at him and say, you know what? I know that guy. I don't believe that sign. And so you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to ignore that sign, and I'm going to keep going because I know what is right. I don't believe that sign is true. And so what happens? You keep driving past, and what do you do? Bloop, you fall over. See, it's irrelevant whether you believe if judgment is coming. The truth of the matter is the Bible says judgment is coming. Is it appointed unto man once to die, and then what? Judgment. So all men everywhere will be judged. And God says for you to be saved, you need to repent. What is repentance? It's a change of what? Mind. Which leads to a change of heart. So, I said all that to say, as we're going to fly through Genesis 43, there's nowhere in Genesis 43 where you see where Judah says, you know what, I repent, I repent, I repent. It doesn't say that. But what is repentance? It's a change of mind that produces a what? A change of action. Right? I want, you, I want to try my best to show you. Did I show you how evil he was? Did, did, did you get that? Okay. Now we're going to see a change of attitude in Judah. All right? And that change of attitude can only come about through repentance. And repentance can only come about through the working of the Holy Spirit in a a person's life. Are you ready? All right, here we go. First of all, verses 1 through 2. We're going to look at Jacob's problem. Look at verses 43, chapter 43, verses 1 through 2. And now the famine was severe in the land. And when they had eaten the grain they had brought up from Egypt, their father said to them, Go again, buy us a little food. So where's the, where are we at? They've already gone once to, to Egypt to get food, right? And then Joseph messed with them a little bit because now he's the second in command. For those that don't know the story, Joseph, who was their brother, was sold into slavery, spent time in prison, out of prison. Now he's second in command of all of Egypt, and he's the one that anybody wants food, they have to go to him. So Joseph went from the pit to prison to the what? to the palace. And that's what God does in the life of people because he's setting people up to bring other people to himself. So now they've already went to Joseph once. Joseph gave them all this food, but he kept one person, didn't he? He kept kept one of the brothers because he wanted them to come back with Benjamin and all that. We're going to see that in a minute. So now we're at 43 this famine's still going on because it's going to last for seven years, and now they need more food. So we see Jacob's problem. 2, verses 13 through, 3 through 15, we see Judah's promise. We see Judah's promise. Judah's promise, not Judas. Judah's promise. Number Verse 3, we see the shortage that demands the promise. Look at verse 3. As I'm trying to find verse 3. Okay. But Judah said to him, The man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with us. So we see the shortage that demands the promise. He says, Look, you must bring back your brother, Benjamin. I want to see him. 
Look at verses 4 through 7. We see the we see the sense that determines the promise. Verses 4 through 7. If you will send our brother with us, we will go down and buy food. Now, Judah's talking to his dad. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For this man said to us, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. Israel said, why did you treat me so badly as to tell the man that you had another brother? They replied, the man questioned us carefully about ourselves and about our kindred, saying, is your father still alive? Do you have another brother? What we told them was in answer to these questions, could we in any way know that he would say, bring your brother down? So you see the problem, all right? Now, we're going to look at the sincerity that declares the promise, verse 8 through 10. And Judah said to Israel his father, Send the boy with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I will be a pledge of his safety. From my hands you will require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. If we had not delayed, we would have now returned twice. Now think about that. Look at the sincerity that declared the promise. This is, this is a heart that's now being moved from being selfish to being what? Selfless. Now remember, now listen. Remember where he was. And now look what he's talking about now. His, he's not so selfish now, is he? He's not so, he's not so self-absorbed, is he? He's now looking after who? His dad and his brothers and everyone else. This is not the same guy that we met in chapter 38, is it? It's a little bit different. And now we see the success that develops a promise, verses 11 through 15. Then the father of Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the choice of fruit of the land in your bag and carry a present down to the man, a little balm with a little, and a little honey, gum, myrrh, pistachio nuts, and almonds. Take double the money with you. Come back with you. Come uh, carry back with you the money that was returned in the mouth of your sack. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take also your brother and arise. Go again to the man. May God Almighty grant your mercy before the man, and may he be sent back to you, uh, your other brother and Benjamin. And as for me, if I'm bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. So the men took this present, and they took double the money with them and Benjamin. And they rose and went down to the Egypt and stood before Joseph. Now, here we go. Here's the main point of the sermon. We're going to look at Joseph's plan. Joseph's plan, 16 through 34. God's purpose for the second trip. Are you ready, church? God's trip, God's purpose for the second trip would be to continue to break down the brothers' hearts' heart and bring them to a place of humility before God. Man looks on the outside, but God looks on the heart. The Bible says in Psalms 51, 17, the sacrifices before God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, who you will not despise. So get this. Are you ready? So before God can use someone greatly, he has to break them down completely. And we see that God is doing that to Joseph's ten brothers. Why? Because God wants to use his ten brothers to bring Israel out of the land of Canaan, which they are being corrupted, into the land of Egypt so they can be preserved so the royal line of Christ will be preserved so that Christ can be born, so that Christ can die on the cross, so that we who are sinners may be saved by his wonderful grace. Isn't that wonderful? So God has to use things to break people down. What is he using in your life to break you down? What is he using? God wants to bring you to himself. God wants a relationship, relationship with you more than you want a relationship with him. And God has to break you down to do that. And he has to do it with everyone. For the rest of the chapter, well, in chapter 42, that was 
my sermon two weeks ago. In chapter 42, we saw how God breaks down a hard heart. Now, in verses 16 through 34, we're going to see six more ways that God uses to, to soften the heart of his brothers, especially Judah. Are you ready? We have to go quick. Number one, in verses 16 through 17, God uses the ex exhibition of grace. Now, remember who these brothers are. It's so important. So look, verse 16 and 17. And when Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of the house, Bring the men into the house and slaughter a male and make ready for the men to dine with me at noon. Then the, the man did as Joseph told and brought the men to Joseph's house. Well, how does God do that? Through the exhibition of grace. Sometimes God will use the exhibition of grace to bring people back to himself. We're just saying, how do you get that from there? Think about this. Did Joseph, did Joseph have to give these guys a big dinner? Did Joseph, now remember, who were these guys, right? Did Joseph have to do that? Did Joseph have to bring them and feed them and give them a great monster dinner? Nope. What was that? What did they deserve? His judgment. What did they get? His grace. What do we deserve? Say it, church. God's what? And what do we get? See, sometimes God brings exhibition of grace to bring us back to himself. See, if we'll always remember where we were and where God done, what God has done, we'll never be ungrateful. Number two, not only does he bring people back to him through the exhibition of grace, he also does it through the exercise of conviction. Look at verse 18. And the men were afraid because they were brought to Joseph's house, and they said, is it because of the money that we replaced all our sacks the first time? We brought it in so that, many of the, that, so that he may assault us and fall upon us to make us servants and seize our donkeys. Think about this. Now they have a conviction. They're going, wait a minute, why is he doing this? Why is he doing this? You see, they were afraid to enter because they knew their guilt. Now, maybe not their guilt of stealing money because they didn't do, they didn't steal money, but they still had a level of guilt. Have you ever met anybody with a level of guilt? They just are so guilty. Oh, Pastor Dan, you don't know what I, I know. But we all have guilt. God is the one who replaces our guilt. How did he do that? How does he do that? By the cross. See, he takes all your sins and he put it upon Christ and then Christ was punished for your sins. You couldn't do it yourself because you didn't have the ability and you didn't have the will and you didn't have the desire. But God, in spite of you, saved you. So how does God bring us to himself? Through the exhibition of grace, through the exercise of conviction. We don't like conviction very often, but man, conviction is a strong thing that God uses in our lives. Oh, Pastor Daniel, I'm, one time, here we go. You still with me, church? This is, I, I got to go quick. You got to listen quick, but this is great. A person came to me once and said, oh, Pastor Daniel, I hate it when I listen to your sermon sometimes. I'm going, well, I appreciate you telling me that. <laughs> That's always good to know. And they said, well, no, no, I mean, you, you're a good preacher and all. I said, well, thank you. But, they, but, man, sometimes I feel guilty. I said, well, I'm going to take a shot here. Maybe you're guilty. And they looked at me and go, huh, maybe I am. See, guilt is not a bad thing. Understanding that we are guilty before a holy God, what does that do? That opens up a floodgate of God's grace in your life. Isn't that wonderful? Listen, you don't have to sit there in your guilt. Repent. Say, God, I changed my mind of sin, judgment, and righteousness. I changed my mind. That is sin, and I'm going to stop doing it. Because it's a change of faith, change of, of pace, right? You once were going this way, God said, halt, about face, march. That's repentance. 
You change your mind, but it leads to a what? Change of heart. Now, I love this part. Now, through the exhibition of grace, through an exercise of conviction, through the encouragement of hope, verses 19 through 24. So they went up to the steward of Joseph's house and spoke to him at the door, at the door of the house. Get this. So they go into the banquet room. They got the steward right there. And then they start confessing everything to the steward. They're, they're about to tell him all their sins. This, I think this is hysterical. So they went with the steward's house, steward, uh, up to the steward of Joseph's house, and they spoke with him at the door of the house. And they said, Oh, my Lord, we came down the first time to buy food, and when we came to the lodging place, we opened up our sacks, and, and there was each man's money in the mouth of his sack, and our money was full of waste. So we brought it back again to, for, with us, and we had brought other money down with us to buy food. We do not know who put the money in our sacks. That's exactly what guilty people do. They start confessing sins to people that shouldn't be. Listen, he was just a steward. I'm sure this guy was going, okay, y'all come. Here's your, here's your seats. And they're going, hey, man, let me tell you what we did. This is what happened. And the steward, I'm sure the steward's going, I'm not the guy you need to talk to. I'm just a steward. But that's what conviction does. Convictions, they, they, conviction, when you're guilty of something, you start confessing the things that you, that you shouldn't be confessing to, to people you shouldn't be confessing to. Our confession to be not to one another, but to who? God. But what did the steward do? He gave them encouragement of hope. Did you see that? And he said, um, verse 23, and he replied, peace to you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has put treasures in your sack for you. I received your money. Then he brought out Simeon out with them. And when the man had brought the, brought the men into Joseph's house and given them water and they had washed their feet and when they had given them donkey fodder. Listen, these people had unbelievable guilt and what happened? God sent a man to give them hope. Listen, are you still with me, church? I know this is long. I'm sorry. I'm not. But you need to get this. This world needs to know what we're for more than what we're against. I'm sorry, y'all didn't hear that part. We need to tell the world more about what we're for than what we're against. Amen. Amen. I mean, we're for life. We're for people. We're for Jesus. We're for God. That's what we're for. And that's what we need to tell people about. We need to give people hope. Because there are a lot of people walking in this world with no hope. There's a lot of people who've been raised with horrible parents, and so they feel like they have no hope. Jesus is their hope. There's a lot of people walking out with a lot of sense of guilt because they have done some horrible things. Jesus frees people from their guilt. We have the message of Christ and His forgiveness, and we need to give it to the world. Amen, church? Amen. Then you see... In verses 25 to 30, how does God break down a hard heart? Through the exhibition of grace, through the exercise of conviction, through an encouragement of hope, through an emotion, through an emotion of concern. This is wonderful. Verses 25 through 30. And they prepared the pre they prepared the present they prepared the present for Joseph's coming at noon, for they heard that they should eat bread here. When Joseph came home, they brought him into the house to them, and they present that they had with them, and they bowed down to him to the ground. Now, wasn't that a direct exactly what Joseph said they were going to do? Isn't that what the dream said, that they are going to bow down? And he inquired about their welfare, and he said, Is your father well, the old man who you spoke with? Is he alive? And they said, Your servant, our father, is alive. He is he's well, he's alive. And they bowed down their heads and prostrate themselves. 
And he lifted up his eyes, and he saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son. And he said, Is this your younger brother of whom you spoke to me? God be gracious to you, my son. Then Joseph hurried out, for his compassion grew warm for his brothers, and he sought a place to weep. And he entered his changer, chamber and wept there. Sometimes, people who are not moved by the fear of God's wrath and judgment will be will be motivated enough by God's grace and love for them. If the holiness of God isn't enough to convict people of their sin, judgment, and righteousness, then the thought of Jesus bearing the brunt of God's wrath for their sins will bring them to Christ. Here we see Joseph who had every right to be angry at his brothers. And when he saw all the brothers together, especially Benjamin, what did he do? He was so overwhelmed with emotion and his love for his brothers that he wept. We should have a, 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 a ability to weep for those who God loves. Then we see that through the evidence of knowledge, verses, verses 31 through 33, then he washed his face and came out and controlling himself, he said, serve the food. They served him by himself and by and them, uh, and them by themselves, and the Egyptians who ate, with, uh, them, who ate with them by themselves, because the Egyptians could not eat with the Hebrews, for it is abomination of the Egyptians. And they sat before him, the first according to the birthright, and the youngest according to youth. And the men looked at one another in amazement. You say, well, well, listen, Joseph knew who they were. And so what did he do? He had them sit all, and they were going, how do you know that? How do you know I'm the oldest? How do you know he was the youngest? Sometimes God brings us to himself because we realize that he knows everything about us. Now, how many of y'all would say, man, there's some things about me. If you knew who I, if you knew I thought these things or I did these things, you wouldn't like me. How many of y'all would be that way, right? A lot of people. Check this out. Are you still with me? God knows every single thing about you, and yet he loves you. Isn't that great? He loves you so much that he brought you here to this point at this time, at this place, to hear this message because you need to hear it. I don't know why you need to hear it. I don't know who needs to hear it, but you need to hear it. No matter what you've done in your life, you've never done anything so evil that God would say, I'm done with you. God says, no, I love you, and I want to bring you to myself. How does God break down hard hearts? Through the evidence of knowledge. God knows who you are. And then lastly, through the examination of the heart. Look at verse 34. Portions were taken to them from Joseph's table, but Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of theirs, and they drank and they were merry with him. You're saying, now, Pastor Daniel, how in the world did you get anything out of that? Well, think about it. Through the examination of their hearts. Why did Joseph give Benjamin the favored son from the favored wife of their dad more food? Who was Joseph in chapter 37? He was the favored son of the favored wife of their father. And what did they do to the favored son or the favored wife of their, of their dad? They beat him up and sold him into prison, sold him into slavery. So Joseph was going to test their hearts and see if they truly have what? Repented. The whole sermon comes down to this. How do you know, Pastor Daniel, that they repented? How do you know? How do you know that repentance came to them? Look at that last line. And they drank and were what? Was there any sense of jealousy? What were they before in chapter 37? They were jealous. What are they now? Happy. Hey, they didn't go, uh, excuse me, uh, second in command of all of Egypt. You gave him five times more than you gave us. That's not fair. The same of us is true in our lives today. 
for those of us who are really Christians, those of us who really follow God, we don't sweat what other people got. We're thankful for what we have. We're thankful when people come to Christ. We're thankful and happy when people give their life to Christ. We're happy when other people do well. Why? Because we've repented of our selfishness and we accept Christ's graciousness. That's repentance, church. That's repentance. Have you repented? Have you? Have you had a change of heart about sin, judgment, and righteousness? Now, did you notice... Nowhere in that did I say, you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to... Listen, it's repentance. It's a change of heart, that, a change of mind that produces what? Where's your heart? Do you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might? Have you ever come to the end of yourself and you realize that you were lost and because of your lostness, because of your sinfulness, that you deserve God's judgment and you gave your life to Christ because of it? You said, God, I want to change my sinfulness for God's righteousness, and I will follow you all the days of my life. Isn't that exactly how I tell people how to become a Christian? Ask God to forgive you of all your sinfulness, accept God's righteousness, and say, God, I will do what? Follow you all the days of my life. Because you did what? You changed your mind about what? Sin, judgment, and what? Righteousness. You repented. It's not saying, God, I'm sorry. It says, God, I changed my mind. It's a change of mind. And if you have a change of mind, it has a change of what? Have you done that? Have you given your life to Christ? Have you repented? With every head bowed and every eye closed, and every heart speaking to God, Right where you are, whether you're a visitor, you're a member, it doesn't matter. Have you repented? God, I changed my mind. God, and we know only the Holy Spirit can do that work of change. But have you changed your mind? Have you given your life to Christ? Truly forgave your life to Christ. We're going to give you an opportunity to do that right here, right now. If you've never given your life to Christ, I want you to know that God wants you to do that right here. Today is the day of salvation, the Bible says. Would you give your life to Christ right here, right now? Our sovereign God, we ask you now that the Holy Spirit do a work of change in people's lives right here, right now. Lord, I pray that there's someone here that's never given their life to Christ, that they'll change their view of sin, judgment, and righteousness. They really see how sin is, really is an affront towards you. That there really is judgment coming. And God, we need your righteousness. God, would you please, God, change people's lives right here, right now. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory and the honor. Lord, we love you because you first loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. No matter who you are, if you, made it, if you want to give your life to Christ, you can right here, right now. We're going to have a hymn of invitation, page 275, I Surrender All. What a great way to do that. Would you all?